Today's session features a Rutgers Business School Executive Education fan favorite faculty member, Christina Curley, known in the industry simply as CK. CK has been teaching in many RBSEE mini MBA programs programs for more than 12 years. Over that time, she's taught on many technologies, including mobile, IoT, AI, and the full suite of immersive technologies. In other recent webinars, CK introduced us to the metaverse and Web3. Now, as promised, she's back covering more about advancing technology, aspects um, of which are both promising and polarizing. In our mini MBA digital marketing program, program, CK teaches a module called The Future Web, which covers blockchain, the metaverse, Web3, and more. Just like the metaverse and Web3 were initially, AI2 is very misunderstood. So I'm looking forward to this walk through what AI is, why it's important, and how it's going to drastically change our lives. CK, you can take it from here. Oh, Margaret, we have to stop meeting like this. I tell you, this is our I think third webinar in under a year where we just keep going through technologies that are as, what did you say, as promising as they are polarizing. And I tell you, as magical as they are misunderstood. And the reason I am calling this shock, awe, and AI is because this technology, almost a hundred years in the making. Do you know how many of our forefathers were so excited to finally see AI crest and mainstream only to be let down in so many AI winters? And now we finally have AI mainstreaming, absolutely positively exploding before our eyes. And what are all the headlines and hashtags and Hollywood movies, it's shock and awe headlines, it's scorched earth, you know, forecast, it's a heck of a lot of AI Armageddon's, it is deep fakes, hellscapes, it is a lot of Hollywood hashtags, it's a lot of my oh my AI bad news, when the fact of the matter is we actually have a lot of opportunities, don't get me wrong, there are a lot of issues. There are a lot of regulations needed, which I'll go over mainly at the end of this presentation, because I want to really clear out throughout this presentation what the true opportunities are, because there are a ton of them. Because what I'm finding is that this is a huge opportunity for us to really, spoiler alert, no matter our age, our job roles, or our industry, trust me on this one, in the next 12, 36, and 60 months, folks, we can use AI to really get ahead, both in our companies and our careers, but we can't do any of that if we don't first separate the true AI facts from all of the fire hose of fears, fictions, and falsehoods. And when I say no matter our age, our job role, our industry, I mean it. Because I know it may be hard to believe this, but I'm, I know I don't look a day over 25, but I'm actually well into my 50s and I'm going to be using AI to get ahead. You know, one thing I love about webinars is I actually can't hear you laughing on the other side of that screen when I say I don't look a day over 25. Yes, I'm joking. But folks, one thing I'm not joking about is I've spent the last 25 years since the World Wide Web was in the dawn of Web 1.0 in the mid 90s, when I was saying, I think this technology is going somewhere. In the wee early days of Web 1.0, when Amazon and Googles and Netflixes were really new, and I said, I really think there's a there there. When we were starting out, I have been inventing and reinventing and repeating around technologies and waiting for these exciting technologies from apps to algorithms from devices to data, from robots to cobots, from web one to web two to web three. 
I've been waiting for a day for AI to crest like it is, no matter our job roles, our ages, and our companies and careers, we can use this next one, three, and five years to really leverage AI to get ahead. But we're not going to get anywhere if we keep looking at all of these headlines of this fake news, this truly fake news on all of this bad news that's not the true issue and not be able to get ahead. So that's what I want to use this next hour on. And I want to go through this in four key ways. But before I do, I want to explain just how vast AI really is. You know, when people say to me, what is AI? I say, well, that's a bigger discussion and probably a two or three day training. But the best way to describe it is that AI is a lot of things, kind of like math. It is not just one thing, it's a lot of fields. Look at this slide right here, okay? See all of these tools and all of these technologies and all of these techniques? Right here on this slide, I can't even fit everything. But think like math, you have arithmetic, you have algebra, you have trigonometry, you have calculus. AI is a lot of different tools, technologies, and techniques, some more complex. But understand this, up in the top right, these chatbots and these large language models, these generative AI that we're hearing about, just these two areas alone, just those two areas that are exploding right now, that are amazing right now, just those two areas, just those two areas alone are what are exploding in the last nine months, just those two areas, that's what's been the huge proportion of growth that has absolutely been the majority of growth that we're having in AI. Isn't that crazy exciting? And what's even more exciting is that when it comes to AI, you can use these technologies and techniques on their own or in combination for strategies, for programs to reach your customers, to grow your business. So in understanding AI, it's like math. It's a lot of different fields. It's a lot of different technologies. Sure, it's a lot to understand, but what we need to understand is just in these two areas alone, we've had so much growth that sure, it's going to change things, it's going to displace things, but it's going to offer us a lot of growth if we're able to separate the AI facts from the fire hose of fictions and falsehoods and fears. And we go about it in a way to grow our careers. And we can better understand that if we're able to go about it in a way to be open-minded and to be really excited about this technology that truly is a way for us to collaborate and to look at it as a way to have it as a tool. You know, history is really a record of our tools and AI is the most advanced tools in humans' history. So we need to look at it in that way, and we need to look at four key ways to wield these tools. And I'm gonna go through four in this webinar. First, we're gonna come in hot and we're gonna look at automation. We're gonna look at the job displacement, and we're gonna look at automation with an open mind. Because the way I look at automation, automation, and really this whole age of acceleration, acceleration, while I know it can be daunting and change can be upsetting, it's not that acceleration is the issue. I know that sounds like, huh? Acceleration isn't the issue. It's lack of preparation and lack of action. It's lack of reinventing and reskilling because when we don't plan for this, and this is one thing that we know is going to happen. It's on every headline. It's in every forecast. We know this is going to happen, so we need to act accordingly. And I'm going to go through this in automation. So that automation is number one. So number one is automation and what we need to do about that. Then I'm going to head over to collaboration. And here in collaboration, AIs have really been given two 
key roles. They've been looked at as either terminators sent to destroy us, those evil terminators sent to destroy us, or job killers out to replace us. Man alive, they've been given very strong roles. But in fact, they're neither. They're actually collaborators, a new breed of collaborators out to advance us. And as I'm going to show you, they're going to be advancing us in nearly every way imaginable. And then we're going to look at creation. And we're going to be looking at generative AI and how the obstacle to ideas, I call it age of ideas, get it? AI, age of ideas, clever. And how creation and the age of ideas and ideas at scale, now that ideas and generative AI, text, art, all that has been democratized, can be done at scale, is no longer an obstacle. We have creation and we'll end on a twist. In the rise of the robots, hold on one second. We actually have a twist. We talk a lot about a world of robots and how that might dehumanize us. Well, humans, take heart. We couldn't be more wrong because in a world with trillions and trillions of robots that we can offload a lot of the robotic roles to, a funny thing happens. And that funny thing is that it doesn't dehumanize us, it actually rehumanizes us. It doesn't make us more robotic, it makes us less. I actually did a TEDx talk on this way back in 2018, and I talked about how the robot and AI revolution was going to make us more human, not less. Why? Because finally, we can stop taking on the roles of the robots. Finally, our teams and our roles can stop being so tech heavy. We'll still do a lot of technology, but our teams can become a lot more balanced. Finally, it won't just be STEM. STEM is important. Science, technology, engineering, mathematics. Finally, it can go to STEM to STEAM, science, technology, engineering, art, mathematics. Finally, companies won't just be focused on technology, but technology as well as the human experience. We will have a human renaissance because now we can start focusing not just on human and machine, but human to human again. So we're looking at a rehumanization. So we're going to be looking at four key areas and not just be looking at the shock and awe and fears and fictions and falsehoods of it all. And again, I will be focusing on the key issues we need to look at, the issues of alignment, the needs for less AI bias, the needs for ethics, all of that very much included but to look at the true opportunities, the true areas that we need to focus on to, as I say, attain the promise and avoid the peril. So let's go in and let's start hot with automation and all the displacement. And the true way that we need to look at automation and preparing for what we know is about to happen. And what I say is a lot more action and a lot less distraction. So CK, can I interrupt and ask a quick question? You sure um, can. Just uh, someone wanted some clarity on one of the abbreviations on a previous slide. LLM is large language models? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Large language model. And please feel free to, to interrupt me. So you probably, we probably heard the term chat GPT and a large language model. What chat GPT is, it's a large language model. And a lot of these terms I know are new and I apologize when I haven't explained. It's a large language model. The way that we've trained this AI, this artificial intelligence 
is on a large language model. And that large language model is so large, it's called the internet up to about September of 2021. It's been trained on all this language and tomes and tomes of data to learn through all of this Wikipedia's and these different sites through Reddit's and the like, so it can get really smart. So when you ask different questions, it can then predict the next answer. So when you're asking questions of like Google Bard, which is a large language model or chat GPT, and it comes back to you with a really smart answer, it's because it's been trained on all that data. So the wonky um, uh, term is called an LLM, which is an abbreviation for a large language model. Okay. Did you hear me? Margaret? Sorry, I wasn't hovering over the mute okay. button um, uh, or to, to unmute myself. Yes. And I let um, the person who had asked that question uh, know uh, as well. So thank okay. you. Okay. But they're called, technically, they're called a large language model. And a lot of time, uh, a lot of times when we use these large language models, they're like, how did they know all that stuff? And they're so smart. And they are so smart. It's because they've been trained on all that data and their recall is so great. And they seem like a wizard and an oracle, and they are. And it's because they're just code and they're just munching through all of that data. So they are really smart. And by the way, I want to remind everyone of something. Artificial intelligence is just that, and it's wonderful and it's great. But I want to remind everyone of the actual definition of intelligence because it gets really wonky here. And because we love watching all these Hollywood movies. I own a lot of them and watch them 10 and 20 times. I'm just in love with them. Intelligence, this definition of intelligence should stick with you for life, okay? Intelligence is this, the ability to acquire and apply skills and knowledge. I'm going to say it again. The ability to acquire and apply skills and knowledge. That is not consciousness. That is not sentience. It is intelligence decoupled from consciousness. However, when you watch Terminator, when you watch any kind of Black Mirror, and I love those both, I love all that stuff, it will make you think that these things are conscious, okay? Now, these kinds of different systems can be mean and can be malevolent and can have bad intentions. And it's usually due to one of two things, bad people behind them, okay? Or usually these systems, it's not because they're too smart, it's because they're too dumb. That's why we have to get more advanced with them. But I'm asked that question a lot and it's a darn good question, okay? But I want you to understand artificial intelligence just means the ability to acquire and apply skills and knowledge. And we have to make sure and understand what intelligence is. Because when we talk, talk about intelligence, it can be both awe-inspiring and a little bit skeptical because you're like, ooh, I don't want them too smart. And I get that. Also, because we watch a lot of fun movies, we get worried that they can be mean. They can be mean if there's a mean intent behind them from bad actors or because we haven't been monitoring them enough which is a discussion for the end. But I'm going to keep going into automation, if that's okay. So automation, let's start hot and heavy. AI can bring major losses and big gains. And we won't really know the major losses and major gains that it'll bring. We just know for sure I am 100% transparent about this, that there are going to be major disruptions, major displacements, and major disorientations. It's going to be a rocky road of both jobs shaking up, and there's going to be major gains as well. This is why I actually want you learning this stuff. It could be 83 million jobs lo lost. It could be 300 million. It could be as many as a billion. It could be 97 million new roles by 2030. A lot of this stuff is going to happen over the next one year, three years, five years, definitely 10 years. A lot of this stuff is going to happen by 2030. A lot of this stuff can happen by the next 15 years, for sure, I think the huge amount is going to happen 
over the next mm, three, five, and seven years. That's my guess. Do I think some companies are going to let some people go and blame it on AI? I'm not going to say that I'm going to say it, but I might have just said it. Whoops. I think a lot of stuff is going to happen. Absolutely. Full jobs, full jobs automated 5% overall, we're saying. 5% of 100%. Basically, one third of everyone's job will be um, automated, but it's going to be the stuff that you don't like doing. I'll get into that in a second. That said, we're looking at anywhere between 15 to probably about $20 trillion globally that will be added because you'll have a lot of uh, net benefit from AI, but we're not really going to know until we know. Because again, only about two of the tools that I even showed three slides ago have exploded in growth in the last six to nine months. Disruption is a cray cray game. It can be really exciting if you're on the side of growth. What I say about this slide for everyone watching this right now, whether you're watching it in real time or watching the recording come out, is that this slide is a choice. We can choose to learn these tools and we can benefit from them or we can learn. It's like disruption or innovation, two sides of the same coin. You can let your company and your career get disrupted or you can invent, reinvent, repeat, and you can allow yourself to innovate and be on the right side of history. At 54, I just continue to learn and relearn and allow myself to be on the right side of history. And I hope to be an example to folks who are 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, and 80, because we can continue to let it be an advantage to us. Heck, AT&T is not a new company, and it has just reskilled 250 thousand employees in Dallas alone and gone from a company that used to be about atoms and now it's about bits. It's not just a young person's game. So we're going to need 120 million people in need of reskilling in the next three years alone. Folks, we're going to need to get good at action, not reaction. Yet all I'm seeing is headlines saying it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. So we're going to need to make that choice. Where I'm worried is about the developing markets, and I am worried about at-risk communities. I'm doing some stuff there in, in my pro bono work, so that's the most concerned I am. We're looking at as many as 45 million Americans could lose their jobs. My question, especially with a uh, election year coming up, is what are we doing to reskill? This is the question everyone's asking. Hey, this big technology is coming. What are we what are we going to do? My question is where's the plan? Because on both sides of the aisle, this helps everyone. This is the biggest most transformative technology. We could be ahead and by we, I mean the entire world. Anyhow, that's that's where I go with this. Let me keep going into more of the stats here. AI will take more tasks than job. It looks like 5% overall of jobs will be fully automated, but 60% of all jobs will have one third of their task automated. The good news, it's basically going to take the, the task that you hate. I'm sorry, you won't be doing as many emails. I'm sorry, you won't be scheduling as many meetings. I'm sorry, you won't be doing as much paperwork. I am actually really sorry, you will be working more than full time. Folks, you will still be working a full-time job. You just will be doing more of the stuff you actually love. You'll be doing more of the human work, the strategic work, all the work that you should have been doing. You want to hear some real irony? You're more likely to be replaced by a human with AI skills than you are to be replaced by an actual AI. What does that mean? Learn how to use systems like chat GPT, learn how to use systems like a mid journey where you can create these great images and the like. I'm not talking go to school and become an AI architect, not at all. I am talking about learning how, if it was 20 years ago, learn how to use Google, 
I, I'm not kidding. I'm saying learn how to use base tools. I'm not asking anyone to become an AI engineer. I'm not even saying you have to become a prompt engineer because literally in a year, the AIs will be able to do this themselves probably actually in six months. I'm just saying, get comfortable. Two hours a week, start using these tools and becoming comfortable with them because this will just be table stakes. So it's not that an AI is going to replace us. An AI, you'll see in the next section, is going to become like an easy breezy coworker of yours that you're going to like to collaborate with. So understand that most of us are not going to be replaced by AIs. Most of us are not going to have our jobs replaced by AI, but most of us will have tasks happily replaced, but we're going to need to reskill and we're going to need to move from the distraction of the discussion into action. And we may need to press our companies on this. You know, never before in history have we seen such a technology that will disrupt us so, but I will say this, you know, the dinosaurs didn't know the asteroid was coming, but darn it, we do. It's it's like every day I'm seeing everyone say, the asteroid is coming. The asteroid, heck that, you know, CK, that asteroid is coming. And I'm going, can we plan for it? Can we start a plan? We're distracting ourselves. I'm telling that humanity in 5, 10, 15 years is going to be like, why did they keep talking about it? Why didn't they start planning for it? So instead of us talking about the asteroid coming, let's start planning. Let's start reskilling. I have so many companies that are asking me, they shall remain unnamed, saying, where am I going to find the workforce of the future? And what I tell them, inside. We just need to reskill, cross-skill. Andrew, if you're out there, in skill. I love I love that term. Start by growing your pipeline inside your company. It will keep your folks engaged and your folks will be even more engaged, higher morale inside your company because AIs will be doing a lot of the tasks that they hate doing. And now you can start right now today growing your workforce and keeping that workforce strong. So understand, like I said before, that slide before, yes, it's some scary numbers, but let's stop talking about that asteroid. Let's start talking about the plan. Let's be the change we seek. You know what's funny? Human nature, God bless it. There are some things that we can set by our clock, and here's one of them. Looking back versus looking forward. Just understand this is as true today as it's ever been. It is easy to reflect backward at what technology will replace. It just is. But it's devilishly difficult to imagine forward at what technology will create. I tell folks this all the time. With all the technologies that I've been through, I've been blessed to be through, I say, try and remember that it's hard to look forward, but it's easy to look back. And they go, what do you mean? And I say, well, did your, did your good grandma say, hey, Sonny, you're going to make for a great data scientist one day? Because if she did, I really, really want to meet that grandma because she's a visionary. She probably didn't because that job title didn't exist that day. You know, I love what Margaret told me. Margaret, it was yesterday, I think you told me. I said, you said, you are training for job titles that don't exist yet. I read in reports all the time that the job titles in 2030, 70% of them don't exist yet. That doesn't scare me because the capabilities that we're training for now, we're building for them. That's okay. That's okay. I actually read a great quote that said, one of the key areas we need to understand is not what to learn, but how to learn fast. I think that's going to need to start changing for kids as soon as they start entering kindergarten and first grade. We need to start teaching how to learn and how to start changing every six weeks. 
behind me on the wall, you can't see because it's blurred out, but I have three different um, metal signs and they say invent, reinvent, repeat. Last year, I was all around Web3 in the metaverse, still am. And understand Apple's supposed to come out swinging on June 5th with a great new mixed reality headset. And this, and as of November last year, I was back into AI after swimming away from it again. And I might be going back to it. And this year it was back into AI. I'm just having to continue to learn my model. I'm a nano business, a business of one, but my model is 50% learn, 50% teach. That's my model. It can't be everyone's model, but I actually don't know how I could be beneficial to my students, to my executives, if that wasn't my model. So it's like for companies, what I'm telling them is, I think your model will have to be some way to engineer four days of work week for your executives and one day a week. You're going to have to figure out how to let them learn that one day a week. And if you can't do that, at least a week and four days and then one day of learning. And they're like, uh, and I'm like, it's just moving too fast. We'll see. We'll see. And did your grandpa tell you what a great AI prompt engineer you'd be? I mean, just think of these ways, just when you can catch yourself, just remember how easy it is to reflect backward, but how hard it is to reflect forward. You want to hear something else? Marshall McLuhan taught us this. Newer forms of media always at first imitate older versions, yet new Tech requires new thinking, new business models, new skills. For example, when AT&T came out with the telephone, how did it market it? The talking telegraph. Heck, when films first came out, they said it's radio with pictures. Have you ever been to a movie theater and it has curtains in front of the screen? It doesn't have curtains in front of the screen because it looks fancy. It's because when they first came out, with movie theaters, they were so used to putting curtains up because they'd had stage plays that they were so used to having curtains because the curtains would hide the actors and the scenery, that it was just commonplace. That is how used we are to looking backwards. The computer that you're on right now, folks, watching this amazing webinar has things called a desktop files and folders. This is a desk. There's no desktop. There's no files and folders, but anything new imitates the darn old. Heck, when the World Wide Web first came out, the major TV studios and television studios said, this thing is going nowhere. There's no way our actors and our studios can fill it up with enough paid media with our actors. There's no way it will go anywhere. They couldn't make the paradigm shift of how it needed a new model. And yet, what's the major model? The major model is user-generated content. Now we have creators and influencers. Those are the ones that fill up this model. What did Margaret tell me yesterday? What do we do to show for cars? It's called horsepower. Folks, any new tech imitates the old. And yet, when ChatGPT came out in November, what was the first thing that education said? Education said, oh my gracious, they'll use this new technology. The students will use this new technology and they'll cheat on their homework. Understood, understood. But they were using this new technology on an old model, right? And what I'm saying is you can't use AI on an old business model. It's a transformative technology, right? What I'm saying is you have to flip a model. What I'm saying is why not, instead of having this new technology in an old business model, why not tape the lectures and have that be the student's homework? But why not have homework in class when the students need the most help of all, right? It makes sense. And then they're not cheating and they're running around the class. They're asking questions. Everyone, the critical learning, the, the engagement is high. Flip the model. 
It's just like the model we have right now. We don't practice healthcare. We practice sick care. When I go see my doctor, I tell him what's wrong with me. I'm usually dying of something, what medication I need. And he says, that's great, CK. May I actually perform an exam and ask you some questions being that I'm the doctor? We practice sick care. We don't practice health care. Look at precision agriculture. Right now, we spray the entire field. Instead of letting AI use the model to say, that's a weed, that's a weed, and only pluck the bad weeds. Folks, when it comes to new models, we need to new technologies. We need new models and new thinking. So with automation, we need new planning. We need action, not distraction. That's the shock and awe. That's the true wonder of AI. So number two, collaboration. When it comes down to it, we have put, oh my gracious, we're about to learn just how little the AIs really think of us. They don't think anything of us. They're too busy serving us. We have put these AIs in the roles of two things. One, terminators sent to destroy us or job killers out to replace us when truly what they're going to be is collaborators out to advance us. Really, AIs don't think about us. Oh, uh, fun fact, uh, AIs don't think, they simulate thinking. And again, they are simulating thinking and their intelligence decoupled from sentience. But they are really collaborators that are working with us to advance us. And what I mean is that they're looking to advance us in basically every way imaginable. I call them cobots, collaborative robots, and they're looking to advance us in every single way. For example, automating mundane tasks. We're going to find out just who's been the robots this whole time. They're going to be automating a lot of mundane tasks. It's taken up way too much of our time. They're going to make the web go from an answer engine to an action engine. What do I mean? These great new plugins that are coming our way. Instead of just going to the answer, uh, going to Google and, and Google, looking to Google an answer and having to go through the search engine, instead of going point and click, I can just ask a question. I can ask a plugin to find the best flight for me, find the best sushi, make reservations for that or find 50 event planners on LinkedIn. This is coming over the next year, if not in the next six months, get the information from me so that I can then spend my time human to human interaction, right? They're gonna also prevent wildfires from going out of control. We are still relying on human monitors. I'm out here in Southern California, it's a really important thing. Human monitors that are looking for wildfires starting. That's important. But what's more important is an AI that never sleeps, that's constantly monitoring satellites, that's finding wildfires in nine minutes or less, that can then tell the human patrol so it doesn't become a mega fire important stuff, preventing diseases from ever taking hold. This is not big brother. This is big mother. These are nanobots. I hear, I understand this can freak a lot of people out, but within the next 10 years, we'll have the availability if we want it or not to have nanobots in our bloodstream. Sounds freaky, but they find out cancer stage zero, not even stage one when the first cell mutates. I hate to say it, um, especially my, my females out there, ovarian cancer stage one, 95% uh, survival rate. Ovarian cancer stage three, 5% survival rate. I just found out um, that an actress um, at the remake of Carrie died in the last week, 28. She found out she had ovarian cancer at 25. These things should just not happen in the 21st century. Until we can solve cancer altogether, we need to be finding it at stage zero and stage one. Um, so being able to use these systems that are constantly looking out for our health and never sleep, constantly analyzing data. Yes, these are cobots. These will advance us in every single way. Helping the disabled navigate the world. We have maps. 
we now need maps like Be My Eyes for the Blind that are helping them navigate the world. We take for granted Google Maps. But you know what? The blind have needed to have help from folks like me that are able to help navigate the world for them. Now the AIs are able to be their eyes. Also, helping our elderly to live freely. You know, there's a lot of wrong news feeds out there about mind reading from the AIs. And everyone's like, see, CK, they're going to read your mind and they're going to be used against you. I'm like, actually, those are for the stroke patients that are nonverbal, that spend 20 years of their life, that they're not able to type out answers for you. But now they can actually communicate. See the fake news out there? Fears and falsehoods. But here's the biggest thing they'll give you back. They'll give you back time because that's the most elusive resource because I can't give you more time in your days, but darn it, those cobots may be able to give you more time because here's some really chilling things. Out of an average 79 year life, we spend 2.5 years just driving. Uh, we spend, this is a big one, 10 months, 10 months waiting in line waiting on hold, just waiting. That really hits me because we get like two, maybe three, maybe four weeks a year uh, of vacation. But here's a great one. Here's where I really want to put my nice cobot to work. Five years, five years cleaning. Yeah. Creation. So we've broken a lot of barriers with a lot of technologies. Mainly, we've broken through with budgets back in the 50s who could break, break, three, break through with commercials, with ad spots, with billboards. And then we came in the web and who could afford the most SEO and the most blogs and the top spots and get scale. But now, thanks to generative AI, all those images and things like democratizing these large language models and the like, $20 a month or free. Now we can finally have scale with things like ideas, right? So I like the way that Megan Keeney Anderson put it. The only thing that has really ever held our ideas back has been our ability to convey them well and at scale. I call it the age of ideas, AI, get it? Cute. So the internet removed barriers to start a business. Web 2.0, all the platforms, the social networks removed barriers to connection. Mobile removed barriers to purchase. Cloud, Slack, Microsoft Teams removed barriers to collaboration. Now generative AI, the mid journeys, all of these great um, tools are removing barriers to creation. So now between that and the social networks that go around interests like TikToks, now finally our ideas, which I find so inspiring, the merit of the ideas can break through. It's not the money, it's the merit of the ideas. Isn't that so inspiring? So now we're finally coming to a time where the merit of the ideas can break through through based on that and sharing those. So now we're finally coming to a time where we can scale that. So nothing is holding us back. So maybe it's not the robots are taking over. Maybe it's not, it's going to be a hellscape. Maybe it's not oppressive. Maybe it's a truly enlightening time. And if you couple that with this rehumanization, this is the last part I'm gonna go through. Maybe there's a lot of upside to all of these technologies. You know, what I talked about five years ago when I, when I did TEDx was I said, you know, it's really not that the robots, intelligent autom uh, automation and AI is going to rob us of our humanity. Maybe they'll restore it because we can offload to the robots so much. And maybe it's not going to rob us of our dignity and dehumanize. Maybe just the opposite will occur. Because while the world is fixating on the rise of the robots, an entirely different phenomenon is going to emerge. And it's not an anti-technology movement. 
just the opposite because AI for people is a blessing, not a curse because automation gets a bad old rap, yet it's the biggest love letter to humanity that's ever been in the moment, in the moment. It's initially cursed, but once you get, once you, you know, give it some, some uh, distance, it's always a blessing because if you give people more time, right? From all those tasks, they can pursue their passions, their projects, their curiosities. That's when they have more time to ideate, to hypothesize, to innovate, all of that. They can go after their own projects and passions. So actually life among the machines will rehumanize our companies, our strategies, our customer experiences, even our personal interactions. My smartphone, my smartphone, all of our smartphones has distanced us because it's so dumb. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, sweetie, you're dumb. Because it's taking so much of our time doing so much stuff. The smarter it gets, the less I'm looking down, the less I'm putting distance. I'll still need my smartphone, but it'll do more for me. And I can put it away more. You know, it's the alone together technology. We'll still need it. Maybe we'll wear it on our face, but it better be pretty if I'm going to wear it on my face. Better be pretty smart, smart glasses. But the point is, is the smarter it gets, the less it's going to create space between us, the more it can do for me. Just like the search engine becomes a smart engine, becomes an action engine, right? The more it can do for me. I always say, damn it, we have been fixated on the World Wide Web for the last 25 years. That dang thing better be focused on me so it can do more for me, right? So it can rehumanize. So what happens is AI has a human renaissance, but I want you to put this down, put a big star next to it. Companies are going to blow it on this because they're going to get, mm, the more things change, the more they stay the same, they're going to get shiny object syndrome. They're going to focus on the AI, focus on the AI. I get it. She's shiny. She's pretty. Focus on the humans. Focus on the humans because the technology can do a lot more now. That's going to become table stakes. Yes. Remove friction. Better, faster, easier. Of course. Focus on the humans. AI's human renaissance, trust me, in a world awash with AIs, with trillion of AIs, all the headlines, the shock and the awe are going to say, oh my gosh, they're going to dehumanize us. It's going to be all this. No, soft skills are going to have a renaissance. It's already saying, you might want to uh, brush up on those human skills. Emotional intelligence, adaptability, leadership. You know what? Leadership, tell them this. No matter how connected your autonomous car Still got to tell it where to go. Collaboration, teamwork, project management, critical thinking. There's one, right? Your robot speaks in code. You speak in context, okay? Your humanness becomes your competitive advantage. Everyone's like, how am I going to compete with the robot, CK, by not being one? You don't compete. <laughs> okay, enough said on that. It's all about hyper-personalization and human experiences. What I love about Starbucks, sorry, is not your coffee. I'm a Dunkin' girl. But what I love about Starbucks oh, is how great they're doing with their AI strategy and tools. They're so smart. They're like, it's all about using these AI tech tools, these digital tools to elevate the analog experience. Chef's kiss. It's perfect what they're doing. They're like, let the robots be robots. They can do the staffing schedules. Let them figure all that out because I want to spend more time on my customers. I want to spend more time. The baristas, better the coffee, better the convos. I'm like, exactly. It's perfect. And they're like, every single one of our stores, I want to be consistent with the quality of the coffee, but every single one of our stores, if it's a suburb in Upland, California versus in the city and Lower East Side, it's completely different vibe. Yep. It, we want it to reflect that. And I'm like, you got that going on. You got that going on. So understand it's the human experience. And so if you do well at that in a time of high, high, high tech, go human, go human, do well on your tech. But this is where a lot of companies will blow it. 
So I talked, I said I would talk about the true issues. All of these are as true as can be, and they're going to be very important to companies to get right. Uh, we need to throw a lot of brains and a lot of money at this uh, at these problems and a lot of countries at these problems too, because these need to be solved and they will be. Folks, we sequenced the human genome. And by the way, those scientists came in ahead of schedule, two years ahead of schedule and under budget. Who does that? Scientists, God bless them. And that was a truly worldwide effort. They never get enough love for that. We can do this too. But we need to go about it right. We need to make them truly priority. We need to be more sensible about it. Things like humans in the loop. The fact that we would ever take humans out of the loop. Uh, I could go for hours on this thing. Misinformation, huge, especially with election years coming up. And especially with all we've learned about this with social networks. Meta, are you listening? Um the past few years. I do have a big problem with AI bias. One, it exists. Two, we are so problematic with racism, especially in this country, that we actually say that the AIs are biased. AI bias is actually human bias. It's being reflected back to us. So it's actually human bias and we need to solve it and we need to do a much better job of solving it especially with much more diverse and inclusive teams. Transparency, huge one. We've actually got a lot of good stuff going there where we need to be much more transparent that you're talking to AIs and much more obvious about it. Ethics, yeah, that's hugely important. Regulations, without question. We need to not just have regulations as one country, but multiple countries. Responsible AI, I could go on about that. Alignment, this is an interesting one. This will take um, several webinars to go through. We need to align human values with computers. Uh, a couple things here. Computers don't work on values. They work on computational objectives. This can be solved, but it needs to be solved with some really bright minds. And we can do it, but we need to put multiple companies, a lot of dollars behind it. And I believe a, a Nobel Prize will be one. And I'm sure there are several more. I'm sorry, I'm going so fast, but these are the true issues. And I'm sure there are several more. My point is this. My point is this. There are major issues to be solved. We can solve them. It's important to do so. Um, we need to be clear what they are. We need to be very open-minded about what these are. We also need to put a lot more action behind things like automation and planning for these reskilling. We need to be very open to about wealth gaps and developing versus developed nations, both as, as uh, companies, as well as countries. We need to understand what the opportunities are, where AIs, play a part in collaboration, understand the creation that's now afforded to us, and better understand no matter what your job title is, whether you're in marketing, supply chain, finance, and the like, the real rehumanization that comes around. But I want to get to some questions. And if I go over the hour, I know that Margaret and I are going to knock out some questions and you can either stay with us or in the recording, I'll go through the answers too, and you can listen to them there. So don't fear and don't fight the future, but please open your mind and please invest time because I swear, no matter your age, job title, you know, or, or anywhere you're at in life, there's a lot of opportunity in AI. And I hope I've been helpful in opening hearts and minds to this. Margaret, back over to you. Oh, CK, thank you so much. Um, an amazing presentation. So much to take in. <laughs> Breathe. Um, but it was a uh, it was a great deal of fun to um, uh, you know talk with you and uh, hear about all this uh, fast paced changes and um, chaos and so forth. Um, oh. So uh, I'm going to thank our audience uh, quickly. I'm going to reverse order a few things because I, I realize that we are probably going to have to take the, the Q&A part, um, you know, a little bit long. So for anybody who did only have an hour to join us, thank you. Um, and thank you for the enthusiastic participation in Q&A. We have quite a few questions uh, to get through. Um, and let's see. Uh, 
people can visit our website to uh, check out our webinars um, mm -hmm. for the schedule. It's uh, business.ruckers.edu slash alumni slash lifelong learning. And the uh, we will be uh, sending you the recording for um, this session to all the registrants and then putting it on the lifelong learning page on our website. I'm sorry, on the business insights page of our website. Um, and anyone who does uh, close out will get um, a, um, a very brief survey to tell us um, what their feedback is on this session and give us ideas for future webinars. So that's kind of an abbreviated version of my usual closing because I, I want to get to that Q&A um, section. Absolutely. So here we go. Do you think that when chatbots and generative AI combine, yes. someone evil could use it to make it look like someone sending a text or in a uh, or being present in a Zoom meeting? And if so, when do you think uh, that would happen? I think absolutely they can, one. Um, I think they can already start doing that, um, which is interesting. But we already are seeing a lot of security efforts against that. Like I have been, I have already seen like people cloning voices that will pretend they're like your kid or your boyfriend. Like I have seen that and that can be really, really scary. What's fascinating is how fast. I see that on my TikTok, or I actually see it's not a chat GPT, but like um, not a Google uh, bar, but like another one came out and said, warning, we've had, you know, a vicious uh, scammer come out. This could happen to you. So have, for example, I told my partner, if you ever hear my voice asking for money and he's like, I hear your voice <laughs> asking for money all the time, but it's usually you asking me, ha ha ha. Um, but I, I said, here is our password. And so he's like, well, that makes sense. You know what I mean? Like if I'm ever asking on the phone, he's like, use a certain password. But it was interesting because TikTok said, make them ask, you know, what's our secret, super secret password rather than having, you know, Apple say there's been a phishing attack and the like. So someone could clone a voice, but I've seen it happen. And then within 48 hours, there's a TikTok going around or a chat GPT will say, we've seen an attack like this, a bad actor doing this. And they'll say, warning, don't fall for these scams. My point is, is that these things can happen, but it so quickly comes to users' attention of how to thwart these. Yes, one Se of our- one Hold of on, our secondly, I'm so sorry, Margaret. Oh, sorry. Secondly, what's really wild is we were really freaked out about these deep fakes, right? For good reason. It's like, oh my God, someone can pretend they're the president. And I'm already seeing- which is what I think is actually a gold mine in this day and age is like, how do you prove you're you? Well, you have things like blockchains and the like, but they're actually coming out with, oh no, this is going to be a service to actually prove identity. So in all of these revenues that are gonna come out of AI, at first, I was thinking, well, here's avatars, here's a service, here's a large language model. I got to tell you, part of the lead of these services is going to be some of these security services because they're like, you're going to, you know, in essence, like a blue check mark, but it's going to be like, here's how you prove it's you. So they're already thinking ahead, like, here's how you're going to have to prove it's you. That's going to be part of the regulatory framework. So they're being really fast about it. It's crazy. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. One of the participants I was going to say had uh, mentioned one of the 
crazy. Specific uh, organ um, entities, uh, synthesia, because um, it can oh. sample any voice and face. Yes. Yeah. Yes. But the thing is, it's like I'm like, because I joked with someone, I was like, well, and I mean, this is going to sound like kind of silly, but I'm like, what if someone were to send like, I mean, I have videos of me speaking. Like, what if someone were to send a video of me and then they make me nude or something? And so I was joking. I'm like, I hope they make me look nice. And then, you know, we were joking. And then Danny looked at me and was like, well, what if they do that to you? I'm like, honey. And then I thought, yep, sign of the times. Oh, my gracious. And then the next day I saw the service and I thought, that's how you verify. But these are the things you have to think about, like for real. And it really becomes important because we have children out there. And I'm like, okay, this is how we're going to have to do it. We're going, because you have regulatory framework, you have all of these things, which is why it's so important. Like we had last week with the CEO of OpenAI. Everyone, um, one of the big services you're hearing right now, uh, ChatGPT, OpenAI, that is the company um, that is the owner of OpenAI, of, pardon me, of ChatGPT and Dolly. Um, but all these companies need to come together to establish these frameworks. But we need these regulatory bodies to come together because there are going to need to be these security efforts but you're going to see a lot of that. So there needs to be that education. That's huge. This is what I'm going to say. Um, and I don't mean it to sound at all cynical. I don't. I have found something in my 30 years in business. When there's a big revenue potential, and there is here, I have found it goes faster with security efforts ramping up um, because it's in a lot of companies' best interest. So I am hoping that's the case here. Where they need to do better is on the bias and ethics part. That's where they need to do better. But they're gonna they're they're absolutely gonna have to. Yeah, because that's huge. Because like like they said, with the synthesia and all that, absolutely. That's huge. Because they can clone the voices and the like. Yeah. yeah, it sounds like the original intent was that for create was for creating things like uh training videos, but someone uh, oh, yeah. thought about thought about other uses for it as well. And you're gonna have that, and you're gonna have that's that is what's so huge is like what I explain is this is the thing. The headline is Terminator. And I'm like, Terminator is not the problem. And I am a very positive person, but there are some negative humans out there. And it doesn't take a million bad humans. It only takes a couple. It's the bad human doing something with the technology. That's where I go. I'm like, it's not, it's not that the, the technology is mean. It's the human is mean with the technology. That's what we need to look for. So that's why I'm trying to explain that's what you have to look into. It's not the Terminator. It's the mean person making the bad technology. But it is it is fascinating the uses for it. Um, we have to we have to be careful of that. But I am I was fascinated how fast they came out with, verifying is going to be a problem. And I thought, if only we had a technology that could verify, and I was like, blockchains. smart. So I'm like, I love that I'm seeing how these pieces come together. Now, another thing was, I want to put this out there. Uh, OpenAI was talking about irises and biometrics and everyone here the headlines went, oh my God, they're going to use our irises and they're going to use our thumbprints. They're going to use it against us. And I went, they're going to use that so that they verify your identity so they can't clone you. So a bad person can. But again, you see what happened with the article? It's okay to be skeptical. In fact, be skeptical. 
let's not be cynical and write the wrong report. Do you see what I'm saying? I'm like, let's be balanced. Please be balanced, you know? So that was interesting. Yeah. All right. So more questions. We had someone who asked for a comparison of the A offerings and capabilities from uh, Microsoft, Google, and others. Oh, so it, this is so subjective. Um, people are, because I'm still doing my testing, but a lot of people are loving Google Bard better. This is what I'm seeing on the social networks. A lot of people that I respect are going like this. This is what they're doing. Buddy, have you tried Bard, which is Google's, right? And the dude goes, not really. And he goes, try it. It's really good. And I will say this. Yesterday, I pay for GPT plus and it made a major spelling error, not spelling error, grammatical error. It used the same adjective in a sentence. I was like this. I wouldn't even make that mistake. Now, we all make mistakes, but I was like, damn, this is the paid for version. So we all make mistakes. So um, I can't say for sure because I haven't given both enough of a try, but I can say people are really loving what Google is out there doing. And I haven't had, I haven't had a go at Microsoft's Copilot yet, which I'm excited to try which is GPT baked into the product. But I can tell you this, standalone products like GPT, they're really going to start baking them into products. It's going to be like the web flows into everything. So right now we're like standalone, but the next generation is just going to flow through everything. So it's going to be like, that's normal. So I can't say, but I can say for right now, people are really going, you should give Google Bard a try, which I'm going to over the next month. I'm going to be giving Bard a lot more love. And it's interesting because the answer to that question today could differ very differently from the answer to that question tomorrow or the next day. It's a little bit of a horse race, like who's ahead today? Dude, BlackBerry, does, uh, and I may be aging myself fine, but BlackBerry was the crackberry. And everyone was like, OMG, I will never, I will die without my crackberry. I think the only reason people have a crackberry right now is to make money from the relic for museums, right? <laughs> I'm serious. Okay. Uh, so, but my point is this. Um, we need to keep trying these. And I was really miffed when it said the most sweeping revolution that is sweeping the nation. That was what it edited my prose as. And I went, I cannot turn this into a class. You know, I was amazed, but I do, I really like the fact. And I, I, I just want to, I want to try Bard. So we'll see. But I, I was, it was interesting. And I was like, I really respect these folks that are saying, give it a try. So, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So uh, the next question is, is it true that chat GPT learns from the questions it was asked and does not have to be programmed to do every single thing like it would have in the past? Oh, I don't know, but I do know that it's constantly learning, but I don't know the specific answer to that. And I don't want to pretend to know something I don't know. I do not know that specific answer. I bet we could ask it. <laughs> ask it. I would, I, I would, I that. would be interested. We should, we should try it and see what it says. But I will say that I don't know. I know that it's constantly learning, but um, we should ask it too. But I, I don't know the specific to that. I just know it's constantly learning. But I do know that it's got to constantly learn somehow because it, it cuts off at September for right now. It's not and for good reason. It cuts off at September, 2021 from the internet. Cause it's like, we had to stop somewhere um, because it doesn't want to keep learning from the internet right now. Um, 
There was actually a question about that. Let me scroll through and see if I can find that. Right. That said, because it's like um, it needs to stop. Because now it's it's like no, we need to not let it keep going on the net. Because then it could be in misinformation about itself. I get why they're doing it. It's for yeah. safety reasons. Yeah. Um, for right now, it's for safety reasons, which I get. Yeah. That this is this was honestly the... they could make it racist and stuff. I mean, honestly, it's yeah. for bias. That but, that is smart on their part. But this Cause, question cause, was more about trustworthy sources. Um, so if if AI is yeah. com- is combing um, you know, the uh, the internet, um, uh, and the example that this person used is um, how does AI determine if something is untrue? For example, if the data put in ah. tells it that the world is flat, won't it conclude that the world is flat? Yes, and, it will. Um, that is a very good question. That is why we need humans in the dang loop. So um, maybe I should have taped myself on this one. I would argue this is why I should have cameras on in my house. Okay. Danny would be like, immediately no. But I'd be like, <laughs> I, I actually think we could make money on this one. This should be, this is maybe what I should do. Video. So um, because there's nothing like when, when I first experience something and then I say, please let me remember this. Cause there's nothing like when you first, you know, are like, oh my gracious. Um, so sometimes <laughs> we're like, this is so smart. Okay. We'll automate it. We'll set it and forget it. Oh, uh no we will not it's you you don't be like okay this is so smart it will learn from the internets and then you know it's so perfect stamp done uh no you will not do that with this um you would need humans in the loop that would constantly check it because <laughs> yeah so we need to keep humans in the loop on that and we need to and certain things like uh lessons on history that would need to be updated sure but that would not be one of them mm-hmm. yeah yeah th- there's that'll be for another course but there's some there's some things that have I'm almost my my jaw drops that I go, this is the system you put in place and you did not and you left it. What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> yeah. So I I'm I'm I don't understand. And um I I I just want to say that that person is correct. And that that's not the way we do things. And we have learned from our mistakes. And I I feel like somewhere, I, the only way I can say is we must have failed them. And I, I, um, I don't understand what we did, but we're not gonna, we're gonna change that. We're gonna change that in a big way. Cause yeah. Although I do wanna say this uh, in case I'm upsetting any of the audience because I, I found out in the last five years, there is a huge, very vocal group that really believes the earth is flat and this is their um, icon and there's a big documentary on it. So I might have that in my audience and I don't want to be rude. I just disagree with you. I do. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. All right. So um... I don't be rude, but I don't agree. (laughs) That's what that it's a cool, like, it's a cool, like sign, but I'm like, no. All right. Um, as the AI gets smarter, is it less yes. likely to become bad? Oh, um, it's a great question. You know, it's. I'm going to come back to that one. I okay. like, I, I really, I really, okay. Let me put it this way. I'm going to, I'm going to rephrase that. 
because I really, I really like this question. As it becomes more aligned with, when we align it more with human values, it it is it is more it is more unlikely to be bad. But we have to we have to figure out a way computationally to explain values to it. This is the hard part. And I really want to explain this well. And I appreciate y'all so much for asking me good questions. And this is one thing we're learning in a world full of answers. We're learning that questions actually really matter a lot. Like people go, well, if we get all the answers from AIs and Google, what will matter, CK? And I say, this is where I stand on the shoulders of giants. They've taught me questions matter. Um, we are going, these computers speak in computational objectives. It's why they're so good at chess because it's a combi, it's math. It's a computational objective, right? It's why I'm so bad at it. Okay. I speak, I speak in stories. Okay. I speak in context, right? And they're speaking. In, um, so the thing is, is that we're trying to get them to speak in stories like us. That's why Greek mythology and all that did so well. It's why we're so good at handing down things like the Bible from generation to generation. It's why we're so good at remembering stories, okay? That's why. But we're trying to get them to speak values like us. And they're just like, literally, that doesn't compute. You got to frame it in an algorithm, you know, in code. So- when we learn, and we will, we've mapped, we've sequenced the human genome. We'll figure this out. Um, but when we can figure out a way for them to align with human values, they'll get less bad. Yes. Yes. Okay, good. Yes. That's a good yes, thing. We will. We will. But, um, and, and also when we, we, we get more systems in place. And I always say, a really great way to thwart a bad AI is a really badass AI. It's just to build it even better. And, and, and the thing is, is like, we just got to get better and better. And we've got some great, look at all the great hackers on our side. Like, we'll figure it out. Like all the hacktivism, like that's good stuff. You know, like that's good stuff. And so, so yeah, we will. And we'll figure, we'll figure it out. Um, and you know, there's can be bumps and bruises. We've, we've got to minimize that. And we've been figuring that out a long way, but we're asking a lot of the great questions now. And, and this is hard stuff, but yeah, we will. But that's a good question. It's, it's, but I, th I think the better question is not better question, the correct way to frame that. And I'm not saying that in a uh, not speaking down at all. I'm just trying to speak in the computer way is when we align how to figure out how to align it with human values, which is people that are far more savvy on this stuff than me, for sure. But we're learning. Yeah, that we are. Okay, I'm going to combine a couple of questions here because they're all about um, yeah. education. So Ooh. um do you, uh, do you think Great. that AI teachers um, could be a thing in the next five to 10 years? Do you think that um, there when should be- When you say be... a thing, do you mean like like a, a, a big growth area? I'm guessing that. Um, yes. And then- well, um, well, Now, the, forever. Do you, do you think that um, there should be AI um, tutors for schools and then- what about college instruction for AI technology theory and methods? Okay, hold on. So they're already, go to Khan Academy. You already, okay. There's going to be human AI teachers. There are already AI's tutors. I, okay, I'm going to answer this the way I think it was intended. There are already AI as tutors. And then there are AI 
human teachers and we're going to need both. There's so many fights and debates over, oh my God, CK, there's going to be no teachers left. And I'm like, I'm sorry. The fact that, again, we look backward, that you think that we are serving children and adults by having one teach for, if they're lucky, 15 students, it's usually 30 to 45, is wrong. And the fact that you can't wrap your mind around, you know, one for 10, and then each kid should get a tutor, like, and adult, you know, wrong. That's, this is the future, right? And we don't value enough education in this country. I mean, let's just revamp the model, you know? So it should be AIs as bots, you know, people as AI teachers, and literally just like math is arithmetic, algebra, calculus, trig, geometry. I know I'm missing more. There is going to be so many types and so many classes and so much theory, and it's just going to be sliced and diced. I honestly believe that it won't necessarily be called computer science. And I just want to tell you that by 2030, if not before, quantum's coming up. And then that's going to be with AI. And I just want to say that we're just talking about generative AI right now and large language models. And I'm not putting them down at all. I heart them. But these aren't even the ones that are going to solve things like traffic and cancer and climate change. These aren't even. I'm not putting them down. These aren't even like the heavy duty things. So yes, yes, and yes, there's going to be all types. Like it's mega. It's all right. well above my pay grade. It's going to be so <laughs> many huge things. Yes, 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 right. yes, yes. There was one more question about uh, schools that um, I'm going to uh, give to you mm -hmm. next, but that's probably going to be the last one that I can stay on and do with you. So the questions that came in about uh, corporate bandwidth, uh, ransomware, um, oh, yeah. uh, sentiment analysis, and Ooh, sentiment analysis is good. Um, you know, some things about uh, regulatory, we, I yeah. will get, CK and I will figure out uh, time and record some uh, answers to those because um, mm -hmm. I, I can't stay on with you too much longer. Plus, whoever's listening to this later, this is a really long, you know, one, uh, one recording. Um, so the question uh, that we'll end with, at least for the moment, um, do you have any ideas about how to fix cheating problems in schools with generative AI or how to incorporate it into schools? Yes. Okay. So two things. Uh, Margaret and I will figure out a time for next week to do more questions on a Zoom. Um, so uh, I'll I'll commit to that. Um, and then for this, uh, I have two ideas. One is any of these large language models is going to have to, and they already have been able to show if a student use them, you can scan them and they'll show if they were used by a person. If um, so they can show, you can copy and paste the text and it will show if it was used in a chat GPT or a Google Bard or any of those. So they've already updated to solve that problem. I believe that that has been shown with 90% accuracy and they're working to get it to 100%. So I wanted, wanted you to know that, okay? But my thing is change the model so that, or at least pilot it and try it. We are still 
using bells at the end of classroom class time, which is a harkens back to the 1950s model of the industrial era that it's lunchtime or time to stop a shift because we're saying this is, and we let kids out during the summertime because that's when they would till the dang fields in agricultural model times. Why not change the model a bit and say, let's do the homework in class when you can't cheat, right? So watch the lecture at night. And I got to tell you, every time I said this to a parent, they're like, please, CK, I'm sick of doing all this homework with my kid at night. And by sick of it, I mean, I'm not an expert at these subjects. And I feel like I'm failing my kid. And I'm also tired from a long day of work. And the kid's like, I don't get this. Can you help me with my homework? And the teacher's like, they're so much more engaged during the class time doing their homework and it helps with lesson planning. So that's what I suggest. So two things, the large language models are showing that the large language model remembers helping the kid with the homework. So you can check for any kind of help with it. So they can't cheat and two, flip the model a bit, at least try it, do a pilot. So it's anti plagiarism or anti extra help or say, flip the model, or three, you can only use a Google or a, a, a large language model for 50% of the help on it. But like, you allow kids to use calculators, you allow kids to use Google, try something different. That's what I would do. Experiment is my point. Uh, sounds okay. like sounds like a plan, and I think it's much more understandable when people hear you say um, about calculators that you know you you need to know how to do the uh, the the functions, but um, you do them much faster if you're using Excel the calculator. We use Excel you know? spreadsheets, right? But to all of a sudden say you can't use Chat GPT in this classroom, but just so you know, when you graduate you will use it and you will use Excel. Okay, so I have to stay behind history until I graduate high school. But CK is doing a webinar and telling everyone, go ahead of time, but we have to not use AI and yet we graduate high school and we have no skills. Oh my God, I just figured out my speech. Okay, love it. We will figure out a way. Thank you for all the questions. I'm sorry I did so much information. You and I will figure out a time for next week. Have a wonderful holiday weekend. Did anyone stay on with oh, us? Oh, certainly. Yes, yes. Um, we okay, had about feel free to listen. I want to give everyone my information. I'm at, let me put this in the, the chat area. I'm at CK. Let me put this in. I'm at CK at all things ck.com and then my text is 347.726.1076 and just get excited about this time i know there's a lot to learn but seriously it'd be so marketable it's awesome so many people lived through like their major technology was the fax machine and you get all this. So you're welcome. <laughs> I say you're welcome. Like I gave it to you. Okay. I'll take credit. And like Margaret gets 20% of the credit. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, okay. So uh, Margaret, send me time for next week. I'm pretty open and we'll do part two. I adore you. You're such a good partner through all of this. Oh, right back at you. Thank okay. you. And, then, and, and thank then we'll everyone who rest. stuck with us. Yeah. Um, and uh, we'll have uh, more to follow. Do me a favor, Margaret, copy and paste the, the questions in, uh, in the queue and then just give me two times for next week and, and we'll do it. All right. Thanks so much. Take care. Okay. All right. Bye-bye, Bye, everyone. everyone. Thank you.